<laughs> Welcome everyone to our first hybrid ISG. Um, it's really exciting to be trying out a new technology and I'm sure uh, it's going to go very smoothly. <laughs> um, before we get started, I'd also just like to acknowledge uh, that we meet here today on the uh, land of the Ngunnawal people and uh, give due respect to their elders, past, present, and future. I'd also like to welcome our speaker today on behalf of ANU and our Indonesian uh, community here, Indonesianist community here. Um, ben is a uh, McKenzie Fellow in the School of Social and, Social and Political Sciences at the University of Melbourne. His research broadly addresses how gender and sexuality shape citizenship in Indonesia. His first book, which is under review, investigates this through a historical study of gender nonconformity and public space focused on the new order and the legendary category of one. His second major project, uh, which is developed out of ongoing collaborations with um, physician Sandeep Namwani, who uh, you might have seen in our uh, ISG last year. Is that last year? Um, and Ignatius Pratdo-Rahadjo from Ahmadjaya University, um, who explore, uh, and the project, sorry, is exploring uh, the contemporary and historical dynamics of HIV governments in Indonesia. Uh, that project is being funded by an ANU Indonesia Project Grant, and uh, a Melbourne University Faculty of Arts Indonesia Initiative visiting scholar grant, and an NLA Social Studies grant. Um, Ben's work is underpinned by commitment to social justice and a concern for global inequality and it's a real pleasure to welcome you here today. Um, ben and I first met on the field work in Jogja, hanging out in the people joints and really place in um, Salibora, so yeah. um, it's really nice to be here at the freezing uh, <laughs> of the yeah. in April. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ben to get started. Thanks everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Elliot, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, everybody, um, for coming on today. Um, thanks especially to um, Bruce, Nuka, and the, the team for um, inviting me to speak at the Indonesia Study Group. Um, it's a real pleasure. And I'm, I'm kind of super excited to present some of the material um, that I've been working on with you today. Um, so before I begin, I would also like to acknowledge um, and pay my respect to the Ngunnawal and Tambri people uh, as the traditional custodians of Canberra, um, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, and I would also like to extend that acknowledgement to all any Indigenous people in the audience. So today's presentation um, is based on some preliminary work that I am undertaking the National Library of Australia on an Asian Study grant, which um, is a fantastic program um, that, that many of you are, are well aware of, which is a project entitled Epidemiological Histories and Community Memories of HIV in Indonesia. So I've said 25 years, although this is a little bit kind of uh, ambiguous and inaccurate, um, and I will kind of speak through that question of, I guess, um, historicity and periodization, which I think raises some, some, some interesting questions that might be able to be placed into conversation with uh, scholars in Indonesian studies and in Indonesian history more broadly, um, rather than being kind of pigeonholed away as a question of, of medical anthropology or of um, kind of uh, specifically concerned with HIV uh, in relation to epidemiology, medicine, and so on, as is sometimes the case. So that's the kind of hope of this project, is that it kind of uh, draws on a kind of rich history of addressing HIV um, ep epidemiologically, medically, and in terms of community activism, and kind of extends that or places that in dialogue with um, Indonesian history broadly conceived, so political and economic history. So that's the kind of broad outline of the project. That said, um, this is all very preliminary. So I've, I've been at the library now for uh, two weeks, a grand total of two weeks. Um, and so the material that I shared today, uh, I guess more, um, and, and my intention in sharing with all of you two, um, who are here on Zoom, is to invite some collaboration, um, some engagement, and hopefully um, kind of some interest in this project at the very least. Um, and I'll, I'll walk, walk everyone through that. But I do have some material to present to you today. It's not just kind of like, you know, help me, <laughs> a plea for help. Um, so, 
before I begin as well, I just wanted to thank the National Library of Australia um, and uh, particularly its Asian Study Grant Program um, and Simone and Sharon at the library who have done an amazing job in, in kind of facilitating um, kind of my entry to archival research. So I was intending to be in Indonesia um, at this time. I prepared my um, research permit application and all the rest, but of course um, that, that was not able to take place. So I'm here in Canberra instead, a lot colder than Jakarta, um, <laughs> but um, no less rich an experience. Um, so uh, I would also like to just draw attention to um, a, an excellent online resource for everyone here and for um, people listening in online, um, pre presented by the Queer Indonesia Archive, um, which is entitled, it's a virtual exhibition entitled Echoes from Our Past, and there are three, three exhibitions. One of those um, looks at kind of community responses to HIV, particularly among the queer identified community. Um, so that's well worth checking out for those of you who are interested in this topic and interested in a more, I guess, kind of um, community-focused um, uh, presentation. What I'm going to talk about today focuses a little bit more on, I guess, the governance of HIV um, and on the kind of epidemiological history um, of HIV rather than the community responses. No less important, but, but that, that would just be the focus for the purposes of, of time. So, what's the next? Oh yes, there we go. So, um, the history of HIV is complicated and beyond the scope of this talk, um, obviously, today. And that's why I want to focus more on the, the kind of early epidemiological responses um, that kind of took place since the late 1980s and into the 1990s. Um, I'll basically roughly run from around 1980, mid-1980s, through till 2006, that's the period that I'm going to address, which is kind of before the, 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 the 1995 point that I, I, I have, or 1994 point really, that I've um, put down in the title. Although, um, for reasons I hope that become clear, 1994, 95 is an important date for lots of reasons in terms of the official recognition um, by the government of, and, and the, uh, in the sense of, an, of a problem related to HIV in Indonesia and the um, presidential decree, I guess it was called, to create um, the, what would become the National AIDS Commission in 1994-95. So that's why um, that date is, is important for lots of reasons. Um, so what's interesting about HIV, I think, is, is, is many things, and the history of responses to HIV is many things, but you, know, you, you could focus on, on many different aspects of it. So one, um, if, we, if we go back to the very early days of the epidemic and it's um, kind of uh, the earliest uh, signs of transmission in Indo within Indonesia, early government responses were characterized by what one might say, denial. Um, so there was this kind of uh, various voices, including um, then minister, minister, the, the then Minister of Health, um, other prominent academics, suggesting that Indonesians were, say, immune from, from HIV transmission, or that morally upstanding people um, uh, needn't fear um, transmission from the virus. Um, that was as early as, say, 1983, um, uh, those kinds of uh, remarks were being made. Those didn't go uncontested, and I think that's the really important thing to stress, and, and one thing that I think is so fascinating about the archive that I'm looking at is that there's no single Indonesian response. Right? There are only Indonesian responses. And even within official kind of um, positions, those are certainly inflammatory positions, right? So those that kind of decreed that Indonesians were immune or that condoms are not to be used because they might promote free sex or um, that harm reduction activities in, in the form of uh, provision of clean needles is, again, immoral and therefore wrong. Those were, were some voices, but they were only some voices. There were lots of voices that were critiquing, engaging with, uh, with, with those kinds of policy responses and trying to, um, I guess, shape what we might call an Indonesian, uh, an epidemiological response suitable to Indonesian culture, right? As it, as it kind of is a living, breathing thing, right? Rather than this verified uh, ideal, right? Of morally uh, outstanding um, uh, members of, of the national community or, or family. So, the other thing that I want to stress in this talk is that this, the ongoing debate and contestation about HIV and how to address it since the early, early 1980s in Indonesia kind of reduces the, or, or 
calls into question the really sharp delineation between community responses on the one hand and expert responses on the other. So, as I hope to show in this presentation, those are in fact a little bit more blurred than is, is sometimes assumed. And those lines have become somewhat hardened um, or increasingly hardened um, of, of late. I mean, for various reasons um, uh, that, that, that um, I won't go into. But, but what I want to uh, kind of reflect on is the way that um, responses to HIV among doctors, among epidemiologists, and among the community working in various ways together in Indonesia brings to mind what Steve Epstein, uh, working in the United States, is called impure science. So a kind of way of tinkering and kind of messing around with uh, available knowledge to generate and sustain responses for people in need. Um, and I can, I can, I'm going to point to a number of examples of that. One example, um, and an important one, is, is, is the early uh, buying schemes um, of antiretroviral uh, drugs, um, which predated the official um, provision of, of, of uh, medication in Indonesia by, by a few years. Um, and they were purchased uh, from India um, initially, and then Thailand. Um, and imported by a group at the, a discussion group at the University of Indonesia, right, who actually forged relationships with drug manufacturers in, sorry, I'm going too slowly on the presentation, drug manufacturers in India, generic drug manufacturers when that became possible, people like uh, Jubhan Tabari and, and other prominent doctors and activists travelled to Indonesia, negotiated um, deals for Indonesians, and then worked out a way to import those drugs, right, several years in advance of the um, widespread provision of antiretroviral treatment in Indonesia. Well, I say widespread, but, but the introduction, at least, um, of subsidized treatment for people living with HIV uh, from around 2004. Um, so uh, there's some really incredible work that's gone on, and I, I think that needs to be recognized. So, Just, uh, I'll give a brief overview of, of what I'm going to kind of go through and the kind of sketch of the history that I'm going to present today. So first um, is that I'll give an overview of the broad profile of the HIV epidemic in Indonesia and then kind of suggest some reasons why looking at its history might, might be important, right? You might ask, people in the audience might ask, well, you know, why, why would it be important to think about um, the past of, of an epidemic like HIV um, when uh, so much concern lies with the future of it, right? But I, I, I think it's really important to, in lots of ways, to think about um, the history of, of the HIV epidemic, not only for, for HIV, but for thinking about Indonesian politics, for thinking about responses to other epidemics and pandemics, indeed. Um, I'll then talk about a little bit about how I, an anthropologist of gender and sexuality, more or less, um, came to this topic and why, you know, why I'm kind of approaching it and how I'm, I'm going to approach it. And then I'm going to look at a brief timeline of some key developments of material, to introduce some material that I've um, encountered during my um, library stay at the library so far. It's, it's early days, but, but some, some material that I've um, encountered so far and, and talk through that before finishing up with not so much a conclusion but some questions and, and, and an invitation to, um, to everyone here to respond to those questions to help out. So since the first case, uh, and then I'd also just like to um, draw attention to a couple of works that have really inspired me and for people who are interested in, in the topic, kind of, to me, um, two, among men, you know, a number, but at least two accessible works. Um, uh, I think The Wisdom of Horse by Elizabeth Pisani is translated into Indonesian. Um, so it's accessible in Indonesian as well, but really offers a fantastic historical perspective of a particular point in time, you know, really the, the early 2000s on, or late 1990s on. And then Prampuram uh, Prampuram Kramat Tunggak, I don't know that that is translated into English. Um, by Endang Sejaniksi Mamai um, is, a, is a wonderful ethnographic account of a localizasi um, in, in Jakarta um, uh, and a very uh, empathetic account, um, ethnographic account of um, the lives of the women who live and, and people who live in, in that, in that um, place. And I think really this book in particular um, speaks to me to the way that ethnographic research has featured, and this isn't kind of an angle that I want to develop further, but ethnographic approaches, really grounded approaches, 
um, in the context of, of everyday life have informed um, the kind of epidemiological culture um, within Indonesia. And I think that's something very interesting that, that needs to be looked at a little further. So these people are kind of not just saying, so epidemiologists and doctors have not only kind of said, this is Indonesian culture and everyone needs to kind of fit within it, but rather they've kind of you know, gone out there and done long-term participant observation, um, not as anthropologists necessarily, but as epidemiologists and others. And I think that's a really fascinating thread to this that I, I think um, that, that I, I want to look at further. Sorry. So, sorry, I've got that a little out of order, but any, in any case, since the first cases were officially recognized in Indonesia in 1987, although that is um, up for debate, I'll go through that in a moment. Um, estimates suggest that 640,000 people were living with HIV in Indonesia as of 2017. I think that's correct. So Indonesia, while a rough generalization, Indonesia has been characterized as a country with a, a generalized epidemic in the province of Papua, on the one hand, and then an epidemic concentrated in several key populations um, in, in urbanized Java and Bali in particular, but in various parts of the country. So these are kind of, that's a rough characterization, um, but, but that's generally how, how um, the epidemiology of HIV is, is um, characterized. So while, um, while it's kind of contested, and I think it's, it's, it's always problematic to say that this X, X, sub, uh, X subgroup, subpopulation, or at-risk population is the fastest growing group, or why uh, at-risk population is the fastest growing group, it's very hard to kind of know precisely. Um, I think it's important to draw attention to the fact that um, several uh, subpopulations or high-risk groups or key populations, as they're called um, in, in, in some other contexts, uh, are, uh, do face much higher rates of infection than the general public population in many parts of Indonesia. So those include people like MSM, men who have sex with men, or the lucky women and sex with the lucky, waria, right, or transgender women or trans women, uh, injecting drug users, uh, prisoners. Uh, and female sex workers, right? Um, uh, uh, these, these, of course, categories, and as I want to speak through in a little bit, are, of course, um, in a sense, political categories, cultural categories. So they change over time, right? So some, some categories might kind of make the cut some year uh, and, and, and be, be prominent. Others might fall away some years. At some point, categories might be split into two. So you know, you might have Wadia and MSM together, as is the case um, in in, in uh, some of the early uh, estimates, estimate project, uh, ex estimate projections, and in IBBS. Uh, in other cases, they might be separated out, right? Wadia as separate from MSM. And I think these kinds of uh, politics um, of, of counting really matter um, a great deal. So apart from um, access to, to testing, which remains a problem in Indonesia, so as we'll see, a, a constant problem and one that I've kind of noticed across the length of the epidemic so far is the distinction between the, the estimates and the total number of people um, who are reported to the Ministry of Health um, as having tested positive. These are kind of, there's an enormous gap there um, and, and I don't know quite how to explain it. Maybe maybe somebody else can, can do that. But to 640,000, is is um, is enormous, right? Um, uh, yeah, not quite sure what's what's going on with with, with that. Um, uh, and then what you additionally have then is a, a very large gap in the number of people who are receiving treatment. So uh, many people here will be aware, but HIV is um, a virus that, if left untreated, um, is largely fatal, right? Um, it, it requires treatment. Um, this is very worrying also. So, so some reports suggest that only 12% or so of people living with, with uh, of, the, of people estimated, the total number of people estimated to be living with HIV are enrolled in treatment, right? A very small proportion of number, proportion of people. Again, that's an extremely troubling, um, but I think is, 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 is worth thinking about um, uh, when we're thinking about HIV governance as well, right? It's, it's troubling on kind of a, a human level, but it's also um, interesting, right? An interesting problem from the point of view of epidemiology, of modeling, um, and so on and so forth. 
So related to this, this question of, of surveillance, uh, which is really what this is about, right? It's knowing your epidemic, um, <coughs> so to speak, is a related problem of the, uh, I guess, recent trend towards, uh, what's the way to describe this? The recent kind of lack of compassion, I guess, uh, in various kinds of reporting um, on HIV that, and, and approaches to managing HIV data, both in the media but among uh, certain actors at, at the political level, I think is, is cause for concern, right? So on the one hand, you've got this push to really know your epidemic much more comprehensively, right? Do more testing, right? Work out uh, who is more affected, right? Who's, what population is more affected than others? But on the other hand, this visibility also is a risk, right? So if you uh, are a person who uh, is, is um, living with HIV, there is the risk, of course, in, 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 unfortunately in Indonesia, and this, is, this has actually ha turned out to have happened um, in many cases, that your identity might be exposed, right, in the media, that your neighbours might come to know, right, and then kind of target you in various ways. And those kinds of, uh, that kind of, relationship, I guess, problematic relationship between surveillance, right, I guess good surveillance, the idea that you need to know your epidemic, um, and the kinds of, I guess, negative surveillance, you might call it, bad surveillance that will inhibit people from accessing treatment and, and care um, and affect their lives negatively, is one that really needs to be carefully considered in Indonesia. That's, that's another. Um, um, and this is especially so um, given that uh, Recently, as recently as last year and, and, and 2018, 2019, 2020, various jurisdictions have um, introduced mandatory testing regimes um, to access uh, a marriage certificate. Right. So to get married in Jakarta, um, you're now required to undergo an HIV test. Right. Uh, a kind of a form of compelled disclosure, so to speak. And I think that these kinds of moves are, are, are very worrying without an adequate infrastructure to, to um, protect people's data, protect people's confidentiality. Um, and this has kind of surfaced various times across the entire length of the epidemic. Okay, so, there we go. So, I come to, I'll go to this one just to change the slides up, but I come to this project, um, as I mentioned, as an anthropologist, um, rather than, than necessarily as an epidemiologist or a, or a historian. Um, and I, a medical historian, and I come at it kind of almost accidentally. Um, so, you know, as, as mentioned in the introduction um, to, to my research, I, uh, my first uh, research really, and research project and my first book, looks at the question of changing patterns of the relationship between gender nonconformity and public space in post-colonial Indonesia. So the role, for instance, that gender non-conforming wadiya, and as they were previously uh, termed uh, banti, the role that that has played in, in uh, generating certain kinds of distinctions uh, that will allow people to move through public space in, uh, or not, right? So really gender presentation as a key kind of mode of governing space. That's my first book. So how on earth did I, I get to looking at HIV? So. Uh, this project really emerges out of close relationships and collaborations with um, many Indonesians and many Indonesian researchers, but Sandeep Namwani uh, in, in particular, a physician um, and a program manager, I think now, at UNFPA in, in Jakarta, who really kind of has prompted me and challenged me to think critically about the governance of HIV and about its relationship to, to vulnerable populations. Uh, Ignatius Proctor Rahajo, or Masgambit, as, as he's commonly known, a kind of amazing epidemiologist uh, based at um, the Center for AIDS Research at Abhijaya um, in, in Jakarta, who has done really pathbreaking work on, on the ethnography of injecting drug users and, and, and their sexual networks um, that I don't think is, is, is you know, adequately recognized in lots of ways. So just a big shout out to, to those two. Um, and yeah, Dr. Yanri Sobronto, who, who um, a, a, uh, HIV physician uh, at um, Gajamada University, um, who again has, has, has kind of undertaken really path-breaking work in thinking about how to allow vulnerable populations in Indonesia to access treatment in a context that is, is very challenging. 
So during my fieldwork in 2014 and 15 in Dr. Carter and, and Jakarta, which is where I was mostly based, I was really struck by the uh, kind of um, impact of the HIV epidemic on Wadia, on, on uh, transgender women that I worked with. It was a real eye-opener. Um, you know, I had several uh, you know, friends and informants um, become unwell and, and some pass away in the time that I was based in Dr. Carter. And what struck me most of all was, uh, I guess, the commitment that my Indonesian collaborators and, and, and our friends had to helping Wadia in the ways that they could to access treatment and care. Yet it still remained to me something of a mystery how it could be that in a place where, to a degree, a testing for HIV is relatively widely available, theoretically available, you know, in all Puskas Mas, especially in Dr. Carter, there are a couple of Puskas Mas with really committed doctors and healthcare workers um, who were close to, to, to the Wadia and, and other, other communities. Um, treatment is also available, right, to, to again, to a degree. Um, there are complexities with access. But I, I struggled, in a sense, to understand how it was that, um, that, that some of my Wadia friends and, and other MSM friends were unable to access treatment and ultimately um, affect their health and, and even their life. So I guess that's the kind of uh, angle that I come at um, from, from, this, uh, from this project. So to move to some of the kind of, so that's the kind of entry point, I guess. But now I'm, I, I'd like to just move to the kind of history and, and offer a kind of potted history, I guess, of HIV responses um, in Indonesia. Um, and, and then hopefully come to some questions as to both why I think this history uh, is important and, and interesting to think about um, and, and to invite everyone's kind of um, input on, on the topic. So, So in 1983, Dr. Tsubairi Jopan, who I mentioned um, earlier as, as one of the doctors who was involved in that University of Indonesia discussion group on HIV that arranged the first uh, availability, the importation, the first generic medication at affordable prices for Indonesian people living with HIV in the early 2000s. But way back in 1983, which is kind of amazing, um, uh, he was uh, working with the Wadia community in Jakarta, um, conducting kind of ad hoc, I guess you could say, with, without, by that I mean without the support um, of, of the Department of Health or other officials, although to a degree he would have had relationships with them. Um, and among them, he discovered a number of Wadia who he suspected to have symptoms of uh, HIV or AIDS. At that time, testing wasn't available in Indonesia. So, you know, this is kind of a, a problem that remains ongoing, right? Widespread and adequate testing remains a problem in lots of parts of Indonesia. But at this time, the testing just wasn't, simply wasn't available. Available in other parts of the world, but not in Indonesia. So, in a sense, it was difficult for um, Dr. Zabrari to, uh, I guess, convey um, or demonstrate conclusively that this was the case. Um, yet, yeah, that, um, that is... That was uh, Dr. Zabari's finding. So, um, in 1986, an AIDS study group was established, and, and this has a close relationship to the University of Indonesia um, AIDS study group uh, that I mentioned earlier. Dr. Zabari um, and Dr. Samsurijal Jalzi are two really important figures in this, um, two doctors who, who really kind of, I guess, pioneered HIV response, early HIV responses in Indonesia. And they remained um, kind of sources that were often um, sought out in the press. So this is an article from Femina in 1992, you know, almost a decade after, um, after these first cases among Wadia were discovered. Um, but uh, uh, these, um, both uh, Dr. Zabari and Dr. Jowsey, um both involved still in the response a response that focused on Wadia, right? Well before there were any kind of official guidance or, or, or suggestion that Wadia and MSM formed high-risk groups, right? So this is really pioneering and groundbreaking stuff, I think, that's, that's going on at this time. That is really kind of thinking about a culturally appropriate um, response to HIV uh, prevention um, and treatment in later treatment in, in Indonesia. So also uh, important here, was uh, 
other doctors and other groups, organisations like the Indonesian uh, Public Health Association, or IACMI, which the, the kind of you know played an early role in catalyzing support and networks um, among uh, Indonesian epidemiologists and physicians in responding to HIV. Um, in 1987, that group held its first seminar on HIV um, for the reason that, as one participant recalled, quote, at the time, Depkes concluded that AIDS was not a disease that needed a priority. However, seeing what had happened in Thailand, and Thailand is often a yardstick or a comparison that is drawn upon, and I think a very fruitful one um, and, and interesting. It's not necessarily the United States, right, or Britain, um, or Australia necessarily, but rather Thailand is, 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 is a constant source of, I guess, um, concern and inspiration, right? And that's, that's, that's also, I think, something that's important to think about. Coinciding, I'll continue this, and coinciding with the celebration of the Year of Tourism in 1991, we anticipated that HIV would enter quickly in Indonesia, end quote, so they said. And you know, so, so, so they proved to be right. It's, it's kind of amazing to think about the kinds of, um, I guess, statements that are being made uh, from as early as 1983, but again and again um, as warnings of an, you know, an impending HIV epidemic, and among particular pop uh, at-risk populations in Indonesia. It's kind of like something very far away on the horizon that you can see coming and slowly moving towards you, but nothing is, nothing is being done to avert it. And people are constantly kind of drawing attention to this fact in the ways that they can, yet official responses, and that official government responses, really lag behind until 2006, uh, which is when um, Nasa Boy became um, the director of, of the uh, Revitalized Commission for AIDS. Um, and really kind of, uh, with international support, catalyzed a kind of, a, you know, a response that was developed in, 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 to a degree in partnership with the community. Um, prior to that time, um, things were very kind of patchy indeed. And there seemed to be a, a rather large gap between what the official government responses at least were and, uh, you know, the concerns expressed by epidemiologists and, and people on the ground. So, in 19... In 1989, um, as early as 1989, uh, Jowsey developed communication, information, and education strategies for school age groups, right? So that's kind of an amazing thing to think about, that in 1989, um, you know, sexual, adequate sexual and reproductive health in Indonesia for young people remains um, an extremely uh, challenging proposition, um, and something I know that is very close to Sandeep's heart. But as early as 1989, Dr. Jowsey was kind of preparing material and willing to kind of share that Schools, right? So you kind of had a, um, a commitment there. Um, he and his wife, uh, Sri Wayuningsi, established Yayasan Palita Ilmu, YPI, um, uh, in that year, and, which was an early NGO that provided various forms of support. So it was also the home of the very first peer educators, right? So those people who, uh, I guess, provide a gateway uh, between um, uh, treatment care and the community, right? The community with, with at that time, particularly little knowledge of, of what HIV uh, is or was and how to deal with it. Um, so between 1993, so around this time, you know, throughout, I also wanted to draw attention, although this falls slightly. Thank you, can you click that? This seems to have that's it. Yeah, so, you know, around this time and throughout the 1990s, what you see is the emergence of extremely incendiary um, kinds of media reporting on HIV in Indonesia. So this is not a problem that, you know, is necessarily recent. Um, you know, this really predates, um, of, of course, uh, much of the, um, what's the way to describe it? Uh, uh, insensitive media reporting in, in Indonesia, um, both about gender and sexual minorities and about HIV by many um, decades. Um, but but a, a big focus was uh, throughout the 19, early from late 1980s and into the 1990s, not only, it was not only uh, MSM and, and Wadia, to, to Wadia to a lesser degree as the kind of focus of this kind of um, insensitive kind of uh, reporting that suggests certain 
certain people are simply um, immoral um, and kind of spreading HIV recklessly in the community, but female sex workers as well, who of course um, were at that time and, and in, to a degree today, were gathered together in local East RC, right, or particular kinds of locations um, as well as outside of them. Um, but uh, this kind of reporting was extremely common, right? So you, you, could, you could pick up kind of um, media reports um, uh, different days of the week and, and uh, find this kind, of, um, this kind of reporting. So, sorry, this seems to... So you can see the development of um, different kinds of networks and approaches um, throughout the 1990s. So, you know, of course, this is a, 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 the, the end of the new order period. So, in a sense, is that, you know, there's a, a distinctive political, I guess, profile to, to this period um, and, and just, just beyond it. But, you know, you see, for instance, um, a couple of examples might be the Jaringan Epidemiology Nacional, which was um, founded in 1992, I believe, funded by the Ford Foundation. So you see, you know, international funding being provided to develop networks. They published a fantastic series of um, short uh, research reports on um, HIV and SCIs in various parts of Indonesia, as they said, from Aceh to Bali. So it was a kind of remarkable kind of network that, that put people in touch with one another. Um, uh, that emerged in 1992. Uh, their kind of executive summary and various reports emerged in, in, in the mid-90s. Um, and then you see, of course, uh, approaches such as, as this one, um, the first HIV AIDS ASEAN regional workshop with Islamic religious leaders, right, where, where Dr. Zabairi was actually in that, in, invited and in the room and managed to present a paper on stigma and discrimination um, towards people living with HIV, which um, many in the, in the workshop, it was said, um, suggested that Dr. Zabairi was exaggerating was a problem. Um, this was also, you know, the kind of moment where, you know, a, a certain kind of Islamic um, caste to uh, approaching HIV was, uh, I guess, developed. So, you know, most notably um, that condoms should not be used as part of uh, HIV prevention efforts because they promote uh, loose morality and uh, free sex um, is, is the easiest way to put it. And that's indeed in there um, in, in this report. Um, among, you know, alongside Dr. Zabari's paper, right? So you can see that even though this is perhaps, you know, there are perhaps dominant voices, there are also other voices in the room, right? Calling attention to important issues um, and not going away, right? All the way since 1983, kind of saying, um, saying a, a similar thing. Um, also things, you know, like, for instance, homosexuality uh, and uh, any sex outside of marriage is abhorrent um, and can't form a part of any HIV prevention strategies. Um, these kinds of proclamations, right, in this book. Um, of course, then shaping what we might think of as the national framework um, for uh, thinking about HIV in the years that followed, right, particularly after the new order, um, when we've seen Islam come to occupy a very um, important uh, place in Indonesian politics. And indeed, it's, it's something that is very important to many people who are living with HIV, right, Islam and religious um, uh, understandings of uh, coping with, with HIV. It's, it's not to say they're not important, but it seems to be when they're kind of framed in relation to a particular vision of national culture that they limit what is possible. They limit imagination. And I, I think um, that's important to draw attention to. Um, okay, so where am I going? Okay, I'm reaching the end of my um, kind of potted history. Apologies to um, many in the audience who, who will be able to um, point out gaps and omissions, and I invite you to do that. Um, but just to move then to, um, to uh, sorry, I, I did want to mention, you know, into the early, you know, early 2000s, um, the emergence of international donors has been really important. That's something else I, I have, I have, that's a big omission here, but the, the Australian um, IDAB and uh, AusAIDS, um, very large contribution to HIV projects in Indonesia since, the, since 1995, I believe, and the United States, um, USAID, the largest donors, contributors to 
Indonesian HIV programs in lots of different provinces in lots of different ways. Um, that's kind of another part of the story that I think is more complicated than what I have time for here. Um, uh, and then, of course, the emergence of the Global Fund, right? The, the, and Indonesia being a recipient in the first round um, in 2003, receiving $16 million US, not a huge amount, um, but, but money that enabled uh, the, the Indonesian Department of Health to provide subsidized antiretroviral treatment from 2004. Um, that's where I'll kind of bracket my history. Um, otherwise, I think it, it will get too complicated for everyone to, um, to, to deal with. So what I wanted to do, um, oh, what have I done with this? Yeah, so I just wanted to share three themes with you before I kind of wrap up with, with one illustration of the direction that I'm thinking of going in. Um, and I'd invite, again, your engagement and, and, and criticisms. Um, I don't want to share three kind of propositions, um, which are, obviously this is very tentative, um, but, but, but propositions <laughs> that I hope you know, can direct um, my research and, and some questions. So the first is um, that historical responses to HIV and AIDS are shaped by their broader political and economic context. Right? So there's no kind of one-size-fits-all biomedical response that is possible um, to HIV, as the history kind of suggests. So this is pretty obvious, um, because Indonesia, over the period of the HIV epidemic, um, has on undergone lots of interesting uh, transformations. So it kind of roughly coincides with the, the, the end of the last decades of the New Order, and the, uh, and the Reformasi period, right? And I think those um, uh, changes, HIV governance provides a very interesting lens on those kinds of changes and the politics of those changes um, in terms of the provision of, of, of both healthcare, but also uh, the provision of widespread services and their relationship to an emergent kind of sense of morality um, that seems to really drive political uh, decision-making in Indonesia. Um, across the board, right? Not just with HIV, but it seems to be the case across the board. Um, Decentralisation is really important to this. So, um, you know, you can see a kind of uh, centralised national response, right? One that was supported by various kinds of um, ad hoc networks, um, or perhaps it's better to say a centralised lack of a response, um, you know, in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Um, then being replaced by a kind of emphasis on local level responses, right? Regional government level responses. This culminated most recently in the dissolution of the National AIDS Commission at the national level, um, and but but the sustaining of regional level um, AIDS commissions, right? The idea being that they could possibly catalyze funding and undertake um, HIV prevention and treatment activities that were more in line with those local um, areas. I don't know whether that is necessarily um, happening, and I think it's also important to think about the way that um, we have this emergence of a national kind of ideal of, cult of, of culture linked to morality, shaping or you know, uh, bouncing off a kind of regional or district level ideal of morality, right? That might be even more kind of um, tenacious than that informed at the national, than that produced at the national level, right? Which again restricts what is possible, which I think is is is, is um, something that I'm 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 interested in. And this is because regions and districts seem to be striving to define themselves, and this is perhaps for political reasons, on terms that are kind of exclusionary. They they project this exclusionary idea of local culture or local morality. And they tend to be rather chauvinistic in their responses, right? Um, and, and this makes it very challenging to, to conduct activities, particularly with populations who are not um, that popular uh, in, in, in some, some, uh, some quarters. So I want to ask then, what lens might scale this changing idea of scale from new order to after the new order, decentralization, um, offer on changing cultures of expertise about HIV? Um, so yeah, what might scale offer, um, a lens on scale offer, um, an understanding of, of shifting cultures of expertise in this transition? So this question of scale, which is linked to counting, shapes how much money is made available. Um, it's, al it's allocated by whom and how it's allocated. 
this is unfortunately clear in the sluggish response by the government, which you know, some bright spots tonight notwithstanding, which seem in part to be um, motivated by the fact that HIV affects key, you know, uh, particular at-risk populations more greatly than others, right? And, and as I mentioned, um, these are groups that often face moral condemnation. Injecting drug users, uh, men of sex men, female sex workers, and so on. So this makes it hard to um, kind of, or, or acts as a barrier in a sense, to adequate forms of accounting, which then can, you know, that, that, that take the shape of, I guess, estimates of populations that can then be used to direct particular kinds of funding. This becomes important if we see a context, or a global context, where funding is increasingly uh, moving away from international, or reliance is moving away from international donors, such as the Global Fund, and towards the national government, right? So the question of keeping um, an eye on how um, estimates are, uh, uh, how accounting takes place, right? How forms of um, the evaluation and, and estimation of, of populations affected by HIV takes place is really important, and a really important political question as well. Um, so that question would be, how has control over finances shaped who is the focus of HIV programs and to what effect? So finally, um, in turn, both scale and finance shape who is captured or counted in data. Um, and this roughly takes two forms. So as I mentioned, you've got the, the estimates, right? So that's kind of modeling, and people now in the context of COVID will, will know what kind of modeling looks like. You know, it's a way of, I guess, guessing, um, you know, a particular kind of um, rate of transmission. Um, on the one hand, on the other, surveillance. So that question of surveillance and adequate surveillance that I mentioned um, earlier. So with calls then for increased testing, including self-testing, and this has been ongoing for, for a while, what seems important is to understand why it is that counting and making visible, so making visible population, which has been, been the case in Indonesia. So we can see here, for instance, as of 2006, um, you know, national report on estimates of adults vulnerable to HIV infection suggested that MS, men who have sex with men, for example, were a population of you know, almost 400,000 to 1.2 million people. That's not nothing, right? It's not like the, you know, the category has been erased, right? The line has been erased. You know, it's, it's, they're there, those, that, that population is estimated to, to be present in Indonesia, um, you know, of, M, of MSM. Um, you can safely say there are MSM in Indonesia, right? Drawing on these statistics from Kapi'a. This can also be used by, for instance, um, Activists, right, and organisations, and indeed, you know, Gewa El Ina, the the first um, uh, gay warrior and uh, MSM group, drew on, on these statistics, right, to say MSM exists, right, we exist throughout Indonesia, and and we need to formulate a network supported by the um, Berlin Institute at that point. So. Um, what's really important, though, is to try to understand why it is that these forms of counting haven't always been necessarily um, equated with uh, action, right? And action, by action, I mean um, you know, adequate prevention, um, uh, forms of prevention, but also treatment, right? Adequate, an adequate infrastructure for, for treatment, which really requires the buy-in of um, uh, hospitals, clinics, and increasingly local level. Um, governance throughout Indonesia. So I do have um, a little bit more, but I, I want to wrap up um, for the purposes of, of inviting everybody's questions. Um, but i just like to sum up in, in lieu of a conclusion by saying that I feel like in this history, in this kind of, sorry to kind of offer you a very scattershot view of, of, of you know, some epidemiological uh, characteristics, I guess, um, of uh, approaches to HIV in Indonesia. But what I want to emphasize is, is that the possibility that we might yet work out a way in which um, Indonesian H through Indo understanding Indonesian HIV cultures, right, or Indonesian epidemiological cultures, or Indonesian cultures of expertise, these are some ways that we might frame this. Um, there might be a way to make HIV visible um, in a form that encourages an accompanying uh, possibility for adequate and compassionate knowledge about HIV. That we don't just kind of 
expose, make it visible, but then leave the rest to a kind of um, opaque, um, kind of uh, opaque, um, and inadequate kind of explanation, right? That generates, I guess, forms of fear and stigma, but rather that these cultures, epidemiological cultures, cultures of expertise, offer clues to provide accompanying knowledge which is grounded in dignity and human rights, right? In, in the Indonesian context, which is true to, I guess, what we might call it, Indonesian culture. This may offer a perspective that is important in tackling not only the HIV epidemic that continues to this day, that affects many people to this day, but also other epidemics and pandemics as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for the presentation, Ben. I want to ask about a couple of things. Uh, one was the decision uh, to um, stop your study in 2006. And I wondered why that was, because I wondered whether there would be a whole lot of interesting material um, emerging over the last five, particularly five and perhaps 10 years. Um, mainly because there's been a kind of a tightening of this, um, or hardening of this moral discourse in society. You know, we're, you know a lot's been written about the, the vilification of, of, of LGBT community in the last five or six years, but more broadly than that, kind of moral campaigns. And not just from within religious communities, but also nationalists getting on board and this sense of threat. So I just wondered why 2006, because, um, it also seems to me a lot of the dynamics of the, of the public discussion about this characterises things like HIV, um, pedophilia, all kinds of other things that are given a moral um, context. They characterise them as things that have come from outside. Mm. That, that more, um, um, you know, local wisdom, more Panchasila education, mm. Uh, more Indonesianisation will, will be an antidote to these kind of external things. And so I'm wondering whether you miss out on some of that element of the, um, of the discussion by stopping it in 2006, because that does seem to intensify the period since then. Um, yeah, I think that's actually probably my main question. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much, Greg. Do you want me to respond to questions? Um, maybe all, I've just got three at the moment, so maybe one by one is fine, I think, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Thanks so much. Yeah, I guess I, um, I would love to continue to look at, at um, 2006 onwards, and in fact, it's, it's, it's kind of a, hmm, it kind of just turned out that way because of the length of the presentation. Um, I kind of just like, <laughs> otherwise I could keep going for, you know, forever. Um, I didn't want that to be the case today. Um, but yeah, this is, a, this is a new project, but yeah, I'm super keen to, to look at the, the changes that, are, that have been taking place since around 2006. What I'm interested in especially, I mean, I think there's a lot been written about um, gender, you know, persecution of uh, gender and sexual minorities um, in the national media, the definition of um, Indonesian national identity uh, against what it's not, you know, this kind of menolak, tolak this, tolak that. Um, this is this is, is is all surfacing since that time, indeed. But what we see, I think, by looking back a little further too, is its antecedents. You know, you, you see, you know, echoes of that um, at various points in time. What seems to happen is that they become a little bit more prominent. Well, much, much, much more prominent. Um, you know, as early as 1983, you've got you know HIV and AIDS is a foreign thing. Indonesians don't need to worry about that. You know, these were proclamations made by seriously senior figures, which is kind of amazing. I mean, similar things were said about COVID. So, um, I mean, you know, there's a there's a history there, right, of of denial um, and and a problem with with the foreign. Um, I guess what I'm interested in is is through, and hoping to address through this is this question of scale. So you know, if, if we think about HIV governance and health governance more broadly, a shifting from a kind of na national centralized kind of thing to much more decentralized form, you know, one would imagine that that would give you lots of diversity, that you have something going on in our, and that's the idea, I think, in a way, you know, it's the idea to encourage 
um, local responses. And this is you know, really accelerated since 2006 and something that's really important. You know, so you know, in, in, I don't know, West Java you'll have one thing, in Bali you'll have another, in NTT you'll have something. But actually that's not the case. What you're seeing is amazingly uniform definitions of local <laughs> culture, right? Um, and and, and the mo a moral cast accompanying it. This of course matters a great deal in the provision of, of, of uh, prevention and treatment for H something like HIV. It matters in other ways too. Um, I don't want to kind of bracket out HIV too much. But I think it's really important to think about that. That's what I'm really interested in. Because I think sometimes, you know, if we focus exclusively on, on, on the national level or just think about it as a national thing, we miss these kinds of, this kind of odd relationship between, or this curious relationship between, um, you know, a kind of push for recognition of diverse approaches through decentralization on the one hand, but this kind of corresponding uh, kind of similarities across all of these places on the other. So I guess that's where I was coming from from scale. But yeah, since 2006, that's that's really important. Thank you. Does that make sense? Yep. Thanks, Ben. Catherine, would you like to go? Oh, thank you, Ben. Yeah, that was really interesting. And I think your questions are really interesting. And thinking about this last one, I mean, what was going through my head when you were talking a lot was um, in the Heruati's research mm -hmm. with the uh, uh, even for newly AIDS, mm -hmm. and I remember one of the guys from the, is it called the AIDS Council, anyway, the local body, he said to me, this is in Bandung in, I guess, the early 2000s, maybe, I can't remember, but he said, oh, you know, what we're really looking at is the next wave is going to be housewives, mm -hmm. and in fact, the women who I met with, Elena, were housewives, and that was really interesting, and, and just those questions you were asking, I think, really goes to that, but going back to those those things you were talking about, about some of the early responses about, um, oh, you know, we Indonesians, you know, we have good families and we don't, you know, we're not at risk of these things and all of that. Whereas what she found and what, what they were talking about in Bundle was that um, a lot of these women didn't even know that their husbands were HIV positive mm -hmm. until they died. Yeah. And you know, it's, and I mean, I noticed I was trying to read your table there with my very bad eyesight, but it, it looked to me like there were two ca two categories that were quite big, which were the partners of um, MSM, which I guess are both male and female, and the partners of injecting drug users who are also male and female, and they seem to be right. very big numbers. Yeah, partner of client of. Yes. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Yes. yeah, and and I thought that was really interesting. And the other thing I found really interesting was the way they were trying to address it. They were promoting the female condom, and I said with this group of women, and I said, "What would your husband say if you said to them, look, I want you to use this?'" And that's how they bash us up <laughs> because they'd say, "You know, why are you suspicious of me?" So I, I thought that was really interesting, and I thought your, your point about visibility and all that, that really seemed to highlight for me, the fact that that yeah. group is kind of invisible, yeah. and maybe also middle class um, drug using, like, you know, the, the people that illness work with, I mean, I yeah. only know about these things through people whose research I know about, but, yeah. you know, these um, young middle class people who are injecting drug users, yeah. and who've got, she, according to her, very high rates, you know. Yeah. Um, so I thought that was a really interesting point, and also that, that linking it back to those really interesting questions about decentralisation, and yeah, that line you were then expanding in your um, response to Greg about yeah. But I, I, I that's, that turned out to be more comment, didn't it? No, that's, I mean, it's interesting, right? I mean, these categories are really important because they, they enable a kind of directing of, of funding in lots yep. of ways, right? And a kind of visibility. Yep. But you can see that they're only ever the partners of, right? Yes. Yeah, yes, which is yes. There's not like, you know, Ibudu Matanga, right? Yep. Well known now and as a category um, uh, estimated to be you know, one of the fastest growing. Mm. Uh, so that is true. Is what this guy said is tr is in fact true. He said that's going to be our next wave. That's. I mean, that's that's in a sense. I mean, in a sense, these categories are difficult, right? Because in, in I mean, what's the line between a female sex worker and Ibu Matanga? Yep, exactly. Right. Yep. Well, you can be both, of course. Yep. Um, and and what would you prefer to offer as your response to someone who asks you? Um, what what it makes difficult, I think, in short, is is among women, um, 
broadly speaking, I focus on Bladia and MSM because for obvious yes. reasons. That's where you're That's where I'm yeah. But, uh, but I, I, I really want to emphasize that it's important to think about the ways that women kind of feature very ambiguously in, in, in these kinds of um, exercises of counting and in, in Indonesia's um, discourse of morality. Right? And I think those two things come together to make something very troubling indeed, right? very hard to access. Um, imagine oneself as both HIV positives and as a Nguru Matanga. What, you know, are, they, are those two categories, you know, can you be both at once? Um, for all of those complicated reasons. Um, so, yeah, and I haven't identified anything yet, you know, in terms of early, that early period, which I think is quite interesting, 80s and 90s, in terms of people um, who are um, looking at ways to think about um, women and HIV and women and um, uh, access, access to testing and treatment. Um, but I would invite anyone to send that information to me or share it with me because I think it's a real, you know, gender remains a really crucial part of this story. Um, and the visibility kind of. And the visibility of, of via one's gender, which is one way in which you become visible, um, apart from sexuality. We have now got an influx of questions from the audience and from online, so um, if you don't mind, we might take a couple from online and then go to Margot as well after that, um, just so that they can remember all the questions. Two from our online audience. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, one is, uh, the first one is from Zane Google. Uh, thanks, Ben. Great talk. I was curious who you take intellectual in inspiration for when thinking about scale. And the second one is from uh, Bo Yuhai. Uh, great talk, Ben. Was wondering if you have encountered many materials that focus on HIV in children, and perhaps a growth of innocence discourse in HIV, and, and if that has changed over time as the epidemic has diversified in Indonesia. Yeah, great questions. Thank you so much. Um, so the first one, who, um, who am I inspired by thinking about scale? Mm, that's a tricky. I haven't theorized this <laughs> adequately yet. I'm sorry. I mean, I was just going back to the awesome work by people like John Legg and others who have, you know, that kind of Indonesian, um, I guess, historians of Indonesia who have thought in really interesting ways about um, uh, the question of decentralization and its relationship to um, the nation, how it defines the nation. Of course, Tom Belstorff has a fabulous article um, on ethno-locality um, in Tapja. Yeah, it's a fantastic article. That, that kind of is a nice, it's like a review of that Indonesianist um, approaches to thinking, thinking about scale, the problem of, of ethno-locality, as he calls it, so this reduction of culture to a particular place, and, and the ways in which it kind of rendered invisible, you know, the, the possibility of an Indonesian national culture I think what we're seeing now is kind of like the inverse of that. So you see these ethno-localities become really kind of powerful entities in their own right, but nevertheless relying on a kind of Indonesian, a, a kind of an echo of, of an Indonesian idea of national morality. So yeah, I go there, I look at Tom's article in Tapcha, and that will give you all of the literature um, that will help you out. Um, yeah. yeah. And then Bo, um, oh, thank you so much for that. I have not. Um, encountered uh, much about um, innocence, right? And I guess, in a way, Ibudu Matanga is also a discourse of innocence in lots of ways, right? Because it's often, I mean, particularly when it's framed as partner of, right, MSN, partner of, you know, um, it becomes this idea that um, Ibudu Matanga is entirely passive and, um, you know, this just kind of happens to her um, through uh, no fault of her own, right? Um, that, in a sense, is, you know, of course, a discourse of innocence, and one closely related. If one thinks of the, you know, the ideal of the family and and, and, and a woman or, or wife or mother's role in the family becomes very, you know, important um, to to define it. The children, I haven't found so much about. Um, what's interesting, I think, was that in 1994, uh, which is when Suharto issued this kind of presidential letter thing, which um, founded the first, what would become the AIDS Commission, 
that was that year happened to be the year of AIDS in the family or something like that. And then the corresponding Indonesian, uh, the first materials, um, you know, 1995, 96, produced by that kind of proto commission, um, were very much concerned with protecting the family. So I think you know in that that's probably one place that um, I think you would see that beginning to emerge. But yeah, '95, not much before that. So yeah, but I'm that, that's a great question. Thank you, thank you both. Thanks, Thanks Ben. Um, and Michael, would you like to? Yeah, I just yeah. had a question to follow up. Something Kathy said I couldn't catch, and and it related to what you were saying about. Uh, women's responses and the use of female condoms is that I missed the Kathy's point on that, whether it's at, whether it's been embraced at all or not uh, in Indonesia recently. not to my knowledge um, and I think that the, the, the story that Kathy recounted was you know that basically their husbands would reject um, you know the use of, of something like a female condom as as tiring their reputation, would you say? Yeah. Suspicion. Suspicion. Like, what are you accusing me of? Yeah. And I can definitely imagine that. There's I mean. interesting material, there's been, and research has been done in Africa, which I can mention to you later, but on this, and how it's used in two contexts. One with prostitutes, yeah. who it's a selling point uh, as an interesting experience, essentially, and the other is in terms of women who are trying to protect themselves. But um, anyway, that was just it. And the children, I just, uh, was another thing. But the I wondered on the drug use question, vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, uh, back in the early 2000s and late 90s, you know, just at the time she worked with them, there were local people working in this area who knew every single person who had was using drugs, in particular communities like in Bali and certain places in Java. And I just wondered if you'd found that was still a resource of people who really were following how the play out of illicit drugs, heroin mainly, and uh, injecting drug use mainly, uh, uh, mapped on to the HIV stuff, if there's way to, if there was any local people doing that as well, mm -hmm. people were the real experts on the drug patterns of uh, injecting drug use. That's right. I mean, uh, yeah, so um, Gambit um, Ignatius Raja and Pepe Ha has, he wrote, um, I think it's a co authored uh, book, but an ethnography in Indonesian, which is about networks of injecting drug users and, um, and corresponding sexual networks of injecting drug users, which is an important, an important crossover. Um, and, and, and route for transmission. So definitely lots of people, um, people working in that space that I'll, um, I'll have to attend to. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, for the presentation. Um, so um, my, I think, uh, and adding to what uh, Pat Greg mentioned, uh, why 2006, because I was just wondering, because in 2012, there's this condom campaign, mm -hmm. and um, it was very interesting because um, you, from your slide, you mentioned this 1999, there was this report issued by World Health Authority, and then the condom campaign in 2012, um, those who opposed that one, the conservative Muslims, they also said that this is a, a sort of campaign um, signifying that the government is basically uh, promoting promiscuity. So it's, 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 it's quite the same, um, the same kind of, I don't know, um, narrative, they use the same kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and yeah, so, and, and, and uh, the, my uh, second one, second point is also following up on what Bo mentioned about uh, children. Um, for the, you mentioned the, the, from the table, the key population, I think this one is also related to your second point in the questions. Um, bec uh, for the children, because uh, Komnas Pelindungan Anak and Komnas Perempuan uh, mentioned that uh, today more than 3,000 um, children, they, um, they got affected already with this uh, HIV, HIV uh, mainly because of these um, mother to child uh, transmissions. And this also 
brings me to the question whether you also will cover uh, women um, with uh, HIV, how, because um, they need to decide uh, how uh, they or how they want to um, uh, take care of children and whether they will continue with the pregnancy and birth, etc. Mm -hmm. And in 2019, there were um, 14 students who were expelled from the school in Seoul because uh, they were with HIV and many parents basically um, in, in the school, uh, they were scared that uh, their children will get affected by this 14, uh, 14 children. So yeah, it was very interesting from that table that was uh, issued by... Papaya. Yeah, they, they didn't mention it. I mean, even the young, um, the range, uh, the age range mentioned there, it's only 14 to something, so not Sorry, even younger, to... younger children. They're not younger children. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for drawing that to my attention. I've got 15, it. Yeah. 15 to 49, perhaps it's on yeah. another page. This is yeah. estimate on adults. Yeah, yeah. The, the, this was part yeah. of a book that's got a lot of, yeah, a lot of data. So it's possible that it's on, it's on another page, but um, yeah, thanks, that's such a great, and, yeah, an important question. Um, I don't know that I have a response for you, but um, yeah, I mean, the line that, you know, um, that comments will destroy the morals of the nation, right? I <laughs> think you can translate that. <laughs> um, and promote free sex, right? You can translate that as well. Um, is a very common one, and, and one that you, know, you can trace, trace well back. But it does seem to originate in that late New Order period. I don't have to, you know, you saw, of course, you know, uh, sex workers are spreading HIV, or uh, HIV is a gay disease. You know, you might see that kind of reporting, but you didn't really see this a corresponding, you know, this will destroy the morals of the nation. That seems to emerge a little later. So, and but it's a, it's just a consistent pattern. There's nothing really new about it, is there? Um, what's new, I guess, is the degree of um, influence or power that um, uh, these organisations, influential individuals, have to shape political will, particularly at the regional level. And that's what I think is is most concerning. Is that you know regional and local level politicians are kind of anxious, I guess, to not be seen as you know, promoting immorality, especially when they go up for re-election. So, um, yeah, so in terms of, and, and I was just thinking in terms of children, uh, along with Bo's question, I think this closely goes with this, this question of gender, this question of Ibu and 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 their visibility within um, HIV prevention and, and treatment programs. I haven't dug in far enough to know about um, prevention of transmission from mother to child in Indonesia. Some, somebody get in touch with me um, and share your knowledge. Um, but it's a really important question. And Congress already issued lots of reports on this one too, oh, on gender excellent. discrimination and yep. AIDS issues, AIDS and HIV issues too. Excellent. So you can Google, uh, we can go to uh, Congress from one and they have a report on that one, special report even on um, um, gender and gender and also children um, and HIV. Excellent. Thank you so much. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. And even they they also direct directed this one to uh, Ministry of Religious Affairs, Ministry of Education, mm -hmm. blah blah blah, because yeah, this education is very important. Yeah, interesting. And the other aspect of this, of course, is like the, you know if we think about the politics of HIV, the politics of funding are really important to it, as Elizabeth Pisani kind of makes very clear. But in Indonesia, it's a bit of a, what's the way to describe it, politely. Um, there's a lot of political manoeuvring around how to split up HIV, um, and particularly when it comes to funding, right? So you see HIV is actually spread across many ministries. Um, you know, it's not just, you know, as one would imagine, uh, kind of uh, completely coordinated by the Department of Health, um, and its subdirectorate um, of HIV and STD prevention, I think is, is what it's still called. But rather, it's kind of like all over the shop. It's like TNE has a bit of a, um, you know, uh, kind of uh, has uh, some programs. Uh, Department of Education has some programs. Ministry of Religions, and so on and so forth. So this is another really complicated aspect of Indonesia's HIV response. It's kind of like, you know, in various parts of 
government, um, which I guess is what Cup Out was designed to do, which unfortunately Cup Out at the national level is no more. So let's see. We have a few more questions okay. online and another one from our in person audience. Um, so I'll just interrupt you, or Nico will read out questions. Okay, uh, this one is from Hegar Egira. What are the significant similarities and differences in the ways that Indonesia, either as a state or a community, responded to the AIDS epidemic in comparison to the COVID pandemic? And the next one is from uh, Ingrid Irawati. We see the role of academics, doctors from public schools in the uh, 80s and 90s, but how about communi communities such as of um, gay and warrior, or some also academic, such as groups, uh, Prawakos, Dayan Santara, for example, from Surabaya, uh, in that history of the uh, HIV response. And this might be more noticeable moving forward to early 2000, which includes the drug user movement. Looking forward to that part of the history of social movements in relation to mm. the HIV response. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, second part. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> I immediately forgot the first one. I'll, I'll just answer the... Yeah, it's a similarity between uh, oh, AIDS and right. from to COVID. Um, yeah, oh, that's, I mean, that's a great question. Um, I am not fully sure, um, you know, um, I mean, another, I mean, perhaps co because COVID and HIV are rather different, it's sometimes a little bit difficult, you know, because HIV, the profile of HIV, um, its mode of transmission, right, it's more difficult to get than COVID. It's, uh, can be fatal. Um, it requires a lifelong adherence to treatment. All of those things make HIV pretty distinct, right? Pretty distinct. So, you know, a more similar and interesting comparison might be H1N1. Mm -hmm. So political responses to, is H1N1 bird flu? I'm not saying, like, I don't know. H1N1. H1N1, possibly, right? Um, you know, which, which was a pandemic that never really took off, but Indonesia was a really important site for research. Um, and engagement. Um, so yeah, so I would direct um, attention probably more to H1N1, although I, I think that um, particularly epidemiological, so what I'm calling cultures of Indonesian cultures of expertise, generally speaking, might offer some, some interesting um, pointers for understanding COVID. I mean, the obvious one, again, is that, that correspondence with between uh, COVID and, and foreignness. Um, uh, yeah, COVID and, and foreign, you know, and saying, oh, you know, Indonesians need not fear, we don't have COVID in Indonesia, and then, of course, two years later, COVID is everywhere. Um, you know, these, these kinds of questions, I mean, it is interesting. Why it is that, along with kind of um, viral transmission, you've got this kind of corresponding anxiety about foreignness. And it would be interesting to kind of look at various points in history where that, um, that is the case um, and why that might be. Um, I hope that's an okay answer for now. Uh, the other one, yeah, no, that's so, I mean, like I mentioned, you know, this is a small slice of what will hopefully be, <laughs> sounds like a lifetime project. <laughs> Very ambitious. Um, but yeah, the community response is so important. What I wanted to emphasize was the way that, you know, you can see that right back in the early, the early 1980s, you've got, um, you know, Wadia uh, working closely with organizations like the Association for um, Public Health um, Practitioners, right? Um, Yakni. You've got Wadia working closely with, with workers there. You've got NGOs being set up that, that collaborate closely with, um, with doctors. So what I guess I wanted to show, and I think, yeah, absolutely, like organizations like Pruakos, uh, yeah, yes, uh, City Kandi in Jakarta, really important body organization, injecting drug user communities, uh, female sex worker community, all of those community responses are so vital and important. But what's interesting is the way, to me at least, in, in, in one way, is the way that epidemiologists and doctors have worked closely with those communities, and then perhaps offered a way that these can be scaled up. One problem, and one that Elizabeth Bissani identifies nicely is the limited capacity of boutique, what she calls boutique approaches, to solve the HIV epidemic in Indonesia. Right? So if you, you kind of have a community in, in one particular place at one particular time and you fund a kind of um, you know, series of activities 
and, uh, and, and then the funding ends and you go away, it's unlikely that, that, that those activities will able to be able to be either sustained or be able to be scaled up around the nation. What's interesting, I think, about the relationship between community and experts, because of immunologists and doctors, is that that has offered a way that um, HIV uh, prevention and treatment has been scaled up in Indonesia in really awesome ways. Um, you know, and I'm also wanting to find ways that I might um, messy, mess up that clear distinction between community and expert. So I think a lot of community members have gone on to become doctors, have gone on to become epidemiologists. Um, and those people are really important to this story as well. Um, as Steve has seen, is, is his book about the United States illustrates that, how many of the early AIDS activists um, in America went on to become doctors and kind of were integrated into the scientific or expert establishment. I'm interested if a similar process happened in Indonesia. I don't know. Did it? <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Um, ben, thanks. Um, it, it's really about Puskas Mas and the role of Puskas Mas in this. Um, because I was thinking back, I think to you were implying that Puskas Mas was the source of these, this early data on, on numbers of HIV. Um, and wondering how trust, trustworthy Puskas Mas was and how much people like Banshi or or Waria would actually have gone to Puskas Mas when they were feeling sick and, and how much they would have found doctors who were willing to deal with them outside the Puskas Mas system. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, I know you said there are a lot of really good doctors in Puskas Mas, but I'm wondering overall whether that's the way you want to characterise Puskas must be very amoral and, and very accepting mm. of, of the people who came with HIV. Yeah, that's such a great question. Um, the role of Puskas must becomes more important as testing becomes available through them, um, if HIV testing becomes available through them. Um, now, I need to read up more about the history of, of, of Puskas must across this period uh, because I'm afraid my knowledge is not, not that good. Um, and particularly, I mean, I'm sure there'd be published accounts by doctors working in Puskas Mas in different parts of Indonesia that I could, could look for um, that would give clues as to how this was the case. Um, the other question, of course, is the reporting of data from Puskas Mas to whatever um, level of government or institution they're supposed to report to. You know, it's hard enough keeping track of all the regional regulations that are passed in Indonesia, let alone the number of cases of HIV, which explains Indonesia's very low, you know, particularly the 90s. You know, you see like um, confirmed cases by the Ministry of Health in the numbers like 100, 200. The estimates placed at 20,000, 30,000. So again, I mean, that gap has remained. I mean, we don't see much change in that, right? You can still see you know, 640,000 estimated. estimated. Um, uh, as an estimate, is, is kind of remarkable. Um, yeah, how the Puskas must, how does the Puskas must fit into this? Yeah, this infrastructure is such a great question, especially as it's rolled up. Um, where the Pus the other interesting question here is, of course, like the relationship between HIV. I mean, Puskas must has kind of played an important role as a conduit for reproductive, various kinds of reproductive health, birth control in particular. So. And I think lots of the, some of the early, I'm just remembering this, but early, some early commentators said, oh great, you know, Indonesia's got this network of reproductive health you know, centers that are focused on reproductive health. I mean, it's perfect for, for a, a, you know, tackling an HIV epidemic, for providing condoms, for providing information. Now, of course, that hasn't panned out to be the case. Um, and that is, of course, tied to um, the kind of way that reproductive health in the Puskas Mas has been framed. Um, but yeah, how it maps onto HIV is a, is a good question. Thank you. Great. Well, we do um, we have more questions, but I think that um, we're very close to the end of the session. So I think we'll um, unfortunately please. have to let some of our online audience. Yeah. Shall I suggest that um, please get in touch with me if, if you would like um, via Twitter. I think I have a Fairly active and private <laughs> 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 um, or email. Um, 
and send you the questions. Yeah, it's on the it's on the first page of my slide. If you just go to that, then people can use that or That's or great. Google me and, and email me, and I'll happily um, receive advice and questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ben. That was really Thank you. Um, and just before we wrap up, I just want to remind people here and online that we um, tomorrow the Indonesia project will um, have a discussion between uh, Dr. Arianto Patunu Patro and uh, the Indonesia's Minister of Trade, Mohamed Lutfi. Um, and also next week we have uh, Greg Feely's um, Indonesia Study Group presentation on the banning of the front umbrella and stuff. So if you'd like to join us for those, you can uh, join us online or back here in the spring. Oh, so I'll tell you tomorrow as well. Uh, oh, no, sorry, that's the Indonesian Project 1 online only. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, everybody.